Section 51 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leonard Wilson. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 1, Section 51, Extracts from Personal Journal by Henri Frédéric Amiel, translated by Richard Burton. Henri Frédéric Amiel, 1821-1881 The French have long been writers of what they call pensées, those detached thoughts or meditations which, for depth, illumination, and beauty, have a power of life and come under the term literature. Their language lends itself to the expression of subjective ideas with lucidity, brilliance, charm. The French quality of mind allows that expression to be at once dignified and happily urbane. Sometimes these sayings take the form of the cynical epigrams of a La Rochefoucauld, are expanded into sententious aphorisms by a La Briere, or reveal more earnest and athletic souls who pierce below the social surface froth to do battle with the demons of the intellect. To this class belong men like the 17th century Pascal and the 19th century Amiel. The career of Henri Frédéric Amiel illustrates the dubiety of too hasty judgment of a man's place or power in the world. A Genovese by birth, of good parentage, early orphaned, well-educated, much traveled, he was deemed on his return in the springtime of his manhood to his native town as professor in the Academy of Geneva to be a youth of great promise, destined to become distinguished. But the years slipped by, and his literary performance, consisting of desultory essays and several slight volumes of verse, was not enough to justify the prophecy. His life more and more became that of a bachelor recluse and valetudinarian. When he died in 1881, at sixty years of age, after much suffering heroically borne, as pathetic entries in the last leaves of his diary remain to show, there was a feeling that here was one more faithful failure. But the quiet brooding teacher in the Swiss city, which has at one time or another immured so many rare minds, had for years been jotting down his reflections in a private journal. It constitutes the story of his inner life, never told in his published writings. When a volume of the Journal Antime appeared the year after his taking off, the world recognized in it not only an intellect of clarity and keenness, and a heart sensitive to the widest spiritual problems, but the revelation of a typical modern mood. The result was that Amiel, being dead, yet spoke to his generation, and his fame was quick and genuine. The apparent disadvantage point of Geneva proved, after all, the fittest abiding place for the poet-philosopher. A second volume of extracts two years later found him in an assured place as a writer of pensée. The journal of Amiel is symptomatic of his time, perhaps one reason why it met with so sympathetic a response. It mirrors the intellectual doubtings, the spiritual yearnings and despairs of a strenuous and pure soul in a rationalistic atmosphere. In the day of scientific test and of skepticism, of the readjustment of conventions and the overthrow of sacrosanct traditions, one whose life is that of thought rather than of action, finds much to perplex, to weary, and to sadden. So it was with the Swiss professor. He was always in the sanctum sanctorum of his spirit, striving to attain the truth. With Hamlet-like irresolution he poised in mind before the antinomies of the universe, alert to see around a subject, having the modern thinker's inability to be partisan. 
this way of thought is obviously unhealthy or at least has in it something of the morbid it implies the undue introspection which is well nigh the disease of this century there is in it the failure to lose one's life in objective incident and action that one may find it again in regained balance of mind and bodily health amiel had the defect of his quality but he is clearly to be separated from these shallow or exaggerated specimens of subjectivity illustrated by present-day women diarists like Bashkirtsev and kovalevsky the swiss poet thinker had a vigor of thought and a broad culture his aim was high his desire pure and his meditations were often touched with imaginative beauty again and again he flashes light into the darkest penetralia of the human soul at times too there is in him a mystic fervor worthy of st augustine if his dominant tone is melancholy he is not to be called a pessimist he believed in the good at the central core of things hence is he a fascinating personality a stimulative force and these outpourings of an acute intellect and a nature sensitive to the ideal are conveyed in a diction full of literary feeling and flavor subtlety depth tenderness poetry succeed each other nor are the crisp compressed sayings the happy mots of the epigrammist entirely lacking and pervading all is an impression of character like pascal Amiel was a thinker interested above all in the soul of man. He was a psychologist, seeking to know the secret of the whence, the why, and the whither. Like Joubert, whose journal resembled his own in its posthumous publication, his reflections will live by their weight, their quality, their beauty of form. Nor are these earlier writers of pensée likely to have a more permanent place among the seed-sowers of thought. Amiel himself declared that the pensée writer is to the philosopher what the dilettante is to the artist. He plays with thought and makes it produce a crowd of pretty things of detail. But he is more anxious about truths than truth. And what is essential in thought, its sequence, its unity, escapes him in a word the pensee writer deals with what is superficial and fragmentary while these words show the fine critical sense of the man they do an injustice to his own work fragmentary it is but neither superficial nor petty one recognizes in reading his wonderfully suggestive pages that here is a rare personality indeed albeit sickly or with the pale cast of thought in 1889, an admirable English translation of Amiel by Mrs. Humphrey Ward, the novelist, appeared in London. The introductory essay by Mrs. Ward is the best study of him in our language. The appended selections are taken from the Ward translation. Richard Burton Extracts from Amiel's Journal October 1st, 1849 yesterday sunday i read through and made extracts from the gospel of st john it confirmed me in my belief that about jesus we must believe no one but himself and that what we have to do is to discover the true image of the founder behind all the prismatic refractions through which it comes to us and which alter it more or less a ray of heavenly light traversing human life the message of Christ has been broken into a thousand rainbow colors and carried in a thousand directions. It is the historical task of Christianity to assume with every succeeding age a fresh metamorphosis and to be forever spiritualizing more and more her understanding of the Christ and of salvation i am astounded at the incredible amount of judaism and formalism which still exists nineteen centuries after the redeemer's proclamation it is the letter which killeth after his protest against a dead symbolism 
the new religion is so profound that it is not understood even now and would seem a blasphemy to the greater number of christians the person of christ is the centre of it redemption eternal life divinity humanity propitiation incarnation judgment satan heaven and hell all these beliefs have been so materialized and coarsened that with a strange irony they present to us the spectacle of things having a profound meaning and yet carnally interpreted christian boldness and christian liberty must be reconquered it is the church which is heretical the church whose sight is troubled and her heart timid whether we will or no there is an esoteric doctrine there is a relative revelation each man enters into god so much as god enters into him or as angelus i think said the eye by which i see god is the same eye by which he sees me duty has the virtue of making us feel the reality of a positive world while at the same time detaching us from it february twentieth eighteen fifty one i have almost finished these two volumes of joubert's pensee and the greater part of the correspondence this last has especially charmed me it is remarkable for grace delicacy atticism and precision the chapters on metaphysics and philosophy are the most insignificant all that has to do with large views with the whole of things is very little as joubert's command he has no philosophy of history no speculative intuition he is the thinker of detail and his proper field is psychology and matters of taste in this sphere of the subtleties and delicacies of imagination and feeling within the circle of personal affections and preoccupations of social and educational interests he abounds in ingenuity and sagacity in fine criticisms in exquisite touches it is like a bee going from flower to flower a teasing plundering wayward zephyr an aeolian harp a ray of furtive light stealing through the leaves taken as a whole there is something impalpable and immaterial about him which i will not venture to call effeminate but which is scarcely manly he wants bone and body timid dreamy and clairvoyant he hovers far above reality he is rather a soul a breath than a man it is the mind of a woman in the character of a child so that we feel for him less admiration than tenderness and gratitude november tenth eighteen fifty two how much have we not to learn from the greeks those immortal ancestors of ours and how much better they solved their problem than we solved ours their ideal man is not ours but they understood infinitely better than we how to reverence cultivate and ennoble the man whom they knew in a thousand respects we are still barbarians beside them as beranger said to me with a sigh in eighteen forty three barbarians in education in eloquence in public life in poetry in matters of art and so forth we must have millions of men in order to produce a few elect spirits a thousand was enough in greece if the measure of a civilization is to be the number of perfected men that it produces we are still far from this model people the slaves are no longer below us but they are among us barbarism is no longer at our frontiers it lives side by side with us we carry within us much greater things than they but we ourselves are smaller it is a strange result objective civilization produced great men while making no conscious effort toward such a result subjective civilization 
produces a miserable and imperfect race, contrary to its mission and its earnest desire. The world grows more majestic, but man diminishes. Why is this? We have too much barbarian blood in our veins, and we lack measure, harmony, and grace. Christianity, in breaking man up into outer and inner, the world into earth and heaven, hell and paradise, has decomposed the human unity in order, it is true, to reconstruct it more profoundly and more truly. But Christianity has not yet digested this powerful leaven. She has not yet conquered the true humanity. She is still living under the antinomy of sin and grace, of here below and there above. She has not penetrated into the whole heart of Jesus. She is still in the narthex of penitence. She is not reconciled. And even the churches still wear the livery of service and have none of the joy of the daughters of God baptized of the holy spirit then again there is our excessive division of labor our bad and foolish education which does not develop the whole man and the problem of poverty we have abolished slavery but without having solved the question of labor in law there are no more slaves in fact there are many and while the majority of men are not free the free man, in the true sense of the term, can neither be conceived nor realized. Here are enough causes for our inferiority. November 12th, 1852 St. Martin's summer is still lingering, and the days all begin in mist. I ran for a quarter of an hour round the garden to get some warmth and suppleness. Nothing could be lovelier than the last rosebuds or the delicate coffered edges of the strawberry leaves embroidered with hoar-frost, while above them Arachne's delicate webs hung swaying in the green branches of the pines, little ballrooms for the fairies, carpeted with powdered pearls, and kept in place by a thousand dewy strands hanging from above like the chains of a lamp and supporting them from below like the anchors of a vessel. These little airy edifices had all the fantastic lightness of the elf world, and all the vaporous freshness of dawn. They recalled to me the poetry of the north, wafting to me a breath from Caledonia, or Iceland, or Sweden, Frithjof and the Edda, Ossian and the Hebrides, all that world of cold and mist, of genius and of reverie, where warmth comes not from the sun, but from the heart, where man is more noticeable than nature, that chest and vigorous world in which will plays a greater part than sensation, and thought has more power than instinct. In short, the whole romantic cycle of German and northern poetry awoke little by little in my memory and laid claim upon my sympathy it is a poetry of bracing quality and acts upon one like a moral tonic strange charm of imagination a twig of pine wood and a few spider webs are enough to make countries epochs and nations live again before her January 6th, 1853 Self-government with tenderness. Here you have the condition of all authority over children. The child must discover in us no passion, no weakness of which he can make use. He must feel himself powerless to deceive or to trouble us. Then he will recognize in us his natural superiors, and he will attach a special value to our kindness, because he will respect it. The child who can rouse in us anger, or impatience, or excitement, feels himself stronger than we, and a child respects strength only. The mother should consider herself as her child's son, a changeless and ever-radiant world, 
whither the small restless creature quick at tears and laughter light fickle passionate full of storms may come for fresh stores of light warmth and electricity of calm and of courage the mother represents goodness providence law that is to say the divinity under that form of it which is accessible to childhood if she is herself passionate she will inculcate in her child a capricious and despotic god or even several discordant gods the religion of a child depends on what its mother and its father are and not on what they say the inner and unconscious ideal which guides their life is precisely what touches the child their words their remonstrances their punishments their bursts of feeling even are for him merely thunder and comedy what they worship this it is which his instinct divines and reflects the child sees what we are behind what we wish to be hence his reputation as a physiognomist he extends his power as far as he can with each of us he is the most subtle of diplomatists unconsciously he passes under the influence of each person about him and reflects it while transforming it after his own nature he is a magnifying mirror this is why the first principle of education is train yourself and the first rule to follow if you wish to possess yourself of a child's will is master your own december seventeenth eighteen fifty six this evening was the second quartet concert it stirred me much more than the first the music chosen was loftier and stronger it was the quartet in d minor of mozart and the quartet in c major of beethoven separated by a spore concerto the work of mozart penetrated as it is with mind and thought represents a solved problem a balance struck between aspiration and executive capacity the sovereignty of a grace which is always mistress of itself marvelous harmony and perfect unity his quartet describes a day in one of those attic souls who prefigure on earth the serenity of elysium in beethoven's on the other hand a spirit of tragic irony paints for you the mad tumult of existence as it dances forever above the threatening abyss of the infinite no more unity no more satisfaction no more serenity we are spectators of the eternal duel between the two great forces that of the abyss which absorbs all finite things and that of life which defends and asserts itself expands and enjoys the soul of beethoven was a tormented soul the passion and the awe of the infinite seemed to toss it to and fro from heaven to hell hence its vastness which is the greater mozart or beethoven idle question the one is more perfect the other more colossal the first gives you the piece of perfect art beauty at first sight the second gives you sublimity terror pity a beauty of second impression the one gives that for which the other rouses a desire mozart has the classic purity of light and the blue ocean beethoven the romantic grandeur which belongs to the storms of air and sea and while the soul of mozart seems to dwell on the ethereal peaks of olympus that of beethoven climbs shuddering the storm-beaten sides of a sinai blessed be they both each represents a moment of the ideal life each does us good our love is due to both self-interest is but the survival of the animal in us humanity only begins for man with self-surrender may twenty seventh eighteen fifty seven 
Wagner's is a powerful mind endowed with strong poetical sensitiveness. His work is even more poetical than musical. The suppression of the lyrical element, and therefore of melody, is with him a systematic parti pris. No more duos or trios, monologue and the aria are alike done away with. There remains only declamation, the recitatif, and the choruses. In order to avoid the conventional in singing, Wagner falls into another convention, that of not singing at all. He subordinates the voice to articulate speech, and for fear lest the muse should take flight, he clips her wings, so that his works are rather symphonic dramas than operas. The voice is brought down to the rank of an instrument, put on a level with the violins, the oboes, and the drums, and treated instrumentally. Man is deposed from his superior position, and the center of gravity of the work passes into the baton of the conductor. It is music depersonalized, neo-Hegelian music, music multiple instead of individual. If this is so, it is indeed the music of the future, the music of the socialist democracy replacing the art which is aristocratic, heroic, or subjective. December 4, 1863 The whole secret of remaining young in spite of years, and even of gray hairs, is to cherish enthusiasm in one's self by poetry, by contemplation, by charity, that is, in fewer words, by the maintenance of harmony in the soul. April 12, 1858 The era of equality means the triumph of mediocrity. It is disappointing, but inevitable, for it is one of time's revenges. Art, no doubt, will lose but justice will gain. Is not universal leveling down the law of nature? The world is striving with all its force for the destruction of what it has itself brought forth. March 1st, 1869 From the point of view of the ideal, humanity is triste and ugly. But if we compare it with its probable origins, we see that the human race has not altogether wasted its time. Hence there are three possible views of history. The view of the pessimist, who starts from the ideal. The view of the optimist, who compares the past with the present. And the view of the hero-worshipper, who sees that all progress whatever has cost oceans of blood and tears august thirty first eighteen sixty nine i have finished schopenhauer my mind has been a tumult of opposing systems stoicism quietism buddhism christianity shall i never be at peace with myself if impersonality is a good why am I not consistent in the pursuit of it? And if it is a temptation, why return to it, after having judged and conquered it? Is happiness anything more than a conventional fiction? The deepest reason for my state of doubt is that the supreme end and aim of life seems to me a mere lure and deception. The individual is an eternal dupe who never obtains what he seeks, and who is forever deceived by hope. My instinct is in harmony with the pessimism of Buddha and of Schopenhauer. It is a doubt which never leaves me, even in my moments of religious fervor. Nature is indeed for me a maya, and I look at her, as it were, with the eyes of an artist. My intelligence remains skeptical. What then do I believe in? I do not know. And what is it I hope for? It would be difficult to say. Folly! I believe in goodness, and I hope that good will prevail. 
deep within this ironical and disappointed being of mine there is a child hidden a frank sad simple creature who believes in the ideal in love in holiness and all heavenly superstitions a whole millennium of idols sleeps in my heart i am a pseudo sceptic a pseudo scoffer born dans sa nature and fini dans ses voeux l'homme est un dieu tombé qui se suivit des cieux march seventeenth eighteen seventy this morning the music of a brass band which had stopped under my windows moved me almost to tears it exercised an indefinable nostalgic power over me it set me dreaming of another world of infinite passion and supreme happiness such impressions are the echoes of paradise in the soul memories of ideal spheres whose sad sweetness ravishes and intoxicates the heart o oh, plato o oh, pythagoras ages ago you heard these harmonies surprised these moments of inward ecstasy knew these divine transports if music thus carries us to heaven it is because music is harmony harmony is perfection perfection is our dream and our dream is heaven april first eighteen seventy i am inclined to believe that for a woman love is the supreme authority that which judges the rest and decides what is good or evil for a man love is subordinate to right it is a great passion but it is not the source of order the synonym of reason the criterion of excellence it would seem then that a woman places her ideal in the perfection of love and a man in the perfection of justice june fifth eighteen seventy the efficacy of religion lies precisely in that which is not rational philosophic nor eternal its efficacy lies in the unforeseen the miraculous the extraordinary thus religion attracts more devotion in proportion as it demands more faith that is to say as it becomes more incredible to the profane mind the philosopher aspires to explain away all mysteries to dissolve them into light it is mystery on the other hand which the religious instinct demands and pursues it is mystery which constitutes the essence of worship the power of proselytism when the cross became the foolishness of the cross it took possession of the masses and in our own day those who wish to get rid of the supernatural to enlighten religion to economize faith find themselves deserted like poets who should declaim against poetry or women who should decry love faith consists in the acceptance of the incomprehensible and even in the pursuit of the impossible and is self-intoxicated with its own sacrifices its own repeated extravagances it is the forgetfulness of this psychological law which stultifies the so-called liberal christianity it is the realization of it which constitutes the strength of catholicism apparently no positive religion can survive the supernatural element which is the reason for its existence natural religion seems to be the tomb of all historic cults all concrete religions die eventually in the pure air of philosophy so long then as the life of nations is in need of religion as a motive and sanction of morality as food for faith hope and charity so long will the masses turn away from pure reason and naked truth so long will they adore mystery so long and rightly so will they rest in faith the only region where the ideal presents itself to them in an attractive form october twenty sixth eighteen seventy 
if ignorance and passion are the foes of popular morality it must be confessed that moral indifference is the malady of the cultivated classes the modern separation of enlightenment and virtue of thought and conscience of the intellectual aristocracy from the honest and vulgar crowd is the greatest danger that can threaten liberty when any society produces an increasing number of literary exquisites of satirists skeptics and beaux esprits some chemical disorganization of fabric may be inferred take for example the century of augustus and that of louis the fifteenth our cynics and railers are mere egotists who stand aloof from the common duty and in their indolent remoteness are of no service to society against any ill which may attack it their cultivation consists in having got rid of feeling and thus they fall farther and farther away from true humanity and approach nearer to the demoniacal nature what was it that mephistopheles lacked not intelligence certainly but goodness december eleventh eighteen seventy five the ideal which the wife and mother makes for herself the manner in which she understands duty and life contain the fate of the community her faith becomes the star of the conjugal ship and her love the animating principle that fashions the future of all belonging to her woman is the salvation or destruction of the family she carries its destinies in the folds of her mantle january twenty second eighteen seventy five the thirst for truth is not a french passion in everything appearance is preferred to reality the outside to the inside the fashion to the material that which shines to that which profits opinion to conscience that is to say the frenchman's centre of gravity is always outside him he is always thinking of others playing to the gallery to him individuals are so many zeros the unit which turns them into a number must be added from outside it may be royalty the writer of the day the favorite newspaper or any other temporary master of fashion all this is probably the result of an exaggerated sociability which weakens the soul's forces of resistance destroys its capacity for investigation and personal conviction and kills in it the worship of the ideal december ninth eighteen seventy seven the modern haunters of parnassus carve urns of agate and of onyx but inside the urns what is there ashes their work lacks feeling seriousness sincerity and pathos in a word soul and moral life i cannot bring myself to sympathize with such a way of understanding poetry the talent shown is astonishing but stuff and matter are wanting it is an effort of the imagination to stand alone substitute for everything else we find metaphors rhymes music color but not man not humanity poetry of this factitious kind may beguile one at twenty but what can one make of it at fifty it reminds me of pergamos of alexandria of all the epochs of decadence when beauty of form hid poverty of thought and exhaustion of feeling i strongly share the repugnance which this poetical school arouses in simple people it is as though it only cared to please the world-worn the over-subtle the corrupted while it ignores all normal healthy life virtuous habits pure affections steady labor honesty and duty it is an affectation and because it is an affectation the school is struck with sterility the reader desires in the poem something better than a juggler in rhyme or a conjurer in verse it looks to find in him a painter of life a being who thinks loves and has a conscience who feels passion and repentance 
the true critic strives for a clear vision of things as they are for justice and fairness his effort is to get free from himself so that he may in no way disfigure that which he wishes to understand or reproduce his superiority to the common herd lies in this effort even when its success is only partial he distrusts his own senses he sifts his own impressions by returning upon them from different sides and at different times by comparing moderating shading distinguishing and so endeavoring to approach more and more nearly to the formula which represents the maximum of truth the art which is grand and yet simple is that which presupposes the greatest elevation both in artist and in public may nineteenth eighteen seventy eight criticism is above all a gift an intuition a matter of tact and flair it cannot be taught or demonstrated it is an art critical genius means an aptitude for discerning truth under appearances or in disguises which conceal it for discovering it in spite of the errors of testimony the frauds of tradition the dust of time the loss or alteration of texts it is the sagacity of the hunter whom nothing deceives for long and whom no ruse can throw off the trail it is the talent of the juge d'instruction who knows how to interrogate circumstances and to extract an unknown secret from a thousand falsehoods the true critic can understand everything but he will be the dupe of nothing and to no convention will he sacrifice his duty which is to find out and proclaim truth competent learning general cultivation absolute probity accuracy of general view human sympathy and technical capacity how many things are necessary to the critic without reckoning grace delicacy savoir vivre and the gift of happy phrase-making may twenty second eighteen seventy nine ascension day wonderful and delicious weather soft caressing sunlight the air a limpid blue twittering some birds even the distant voices of the city have something young and spring-like in them it is indeed a new birth the ascension of the saviour of men is symbolized by the expansion this heavenward yearning of nature i feel myself born again all the windows of the soul are clear forms lines tents reflections sounds contrasts and harmonies the general play and interchange of things it is all enchanting in my courtyard the ivy is green again the chestnut tree is full of leaf the persian lilac beside the little fountain is flushed with red and just about to flower through the wide openings to the right and left of the old college of calvin i see the salev above the trees of saint antoine the voiron above the hill of coligny while the three flights of steps which from landing to landing lead between two high walls from the rue verdun to the terrace of the tranchee recall to one's imagination some old city of the south a glimpse of perugia or of malaga all the bells are ringing it is the hour of worship a historical and religious impression mingles with the picturesque the musical the poetical impressions of the scene all the peoples of christendom all the churches scattered over the globe are celebrating at this moment the glory of the crucified and what are those many nations doing who have other prophets and honor the divinity in other ways the jews the mussulmans the buddhists the vishnuists the gubers they have other sacred days other rites other solemnities other beliefs but all have some religion some ideal end for life all aim at raising man above the sorrows and smallnesses of the present and of the individual existence all have faith in something greater than themselves all pray all bow all adore 
all see beyond nature spirit and beyond evil good all bear witness to the invisible here we have the link which binds all peoples together all men are equally creatures of sorrow and desire of hope and fear all long to recover some lost harmony with the great order of things and to feel themselves approved and blessed by the author of the universe all know what suffering is and yearn for happiness all know what sin is and feel the need of pardon christianity reduced to its original simplicity is the reconciliation of the sinner with god by means of the certainty that god loves in spite of everything and that he chastises because he loves christianity furnished a new motive and a new strength for the achievement of moral perfection it made holiness attractive by giving to it the air of filial gratitude july twenty eighth eighteen eighty this afternoon i have had a walk in the sunshine and have just come back rejoicing in a renewed communion with nature the waters of the rhone and the arve the murmur of the river the austerity of its banks the brilliancy of the foliage the play of the leaves the splendor of the july sunlight the rich fertility of the fields the lucidity of the distant mountains the whiteness of the glaciers under the azure serenity of the sky the sparkle and foam of the mingling rivers the leafy masses of the labati woods all and everything delighted me it seemed to me as though the years of strength had come back to me i was overwhelmed with sensations i was surprised and grateful the universal life carried me on its breast the summer's caress went to my heart once more my eyes beheld the vast horizons the soaring peaks the blue lakes the winding valleys and all the free outlets of old days and yet there was no painful sense of longing the scene left upon me an indefinable impression which was neither hope nor desire nor regret but rather a sense of emotion of passionate impulse mingled with admiration and anxiety i am conscious at once of joy and of want beyond what i possess i see the impossible and the unattainable i gauge my own wealth and poverty in a word i am and i am not my inner state is one of contradiction because it is one of transition. April 10th, 1881. He died May 11th. What dupes we are of our own desires! Destiny has two ways of crushing us, by refusing our wishes, and by fulfilling them. But he who only wills what God wills escapes both catastrophes all things work together for his good end of section 51 end of library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume 1 recording by leonard wilson of springfield ohio